A matchless triumph of imagination and ingenuity, the International Space Station is among humanity's truly landmark achievements. The most audacious, expensive and technologically complex structure ever built, it represents the ultimate expression of mankind's boundless appetite for exploration and discovery. This month marks the 20th straight year that the International Space Station has been inhabited by astronauts. A remarkable milestone and a tribute to the myriad strokes of engineering genius that contributed to the station's construction. So today, we're going to explore the insane engineering of the ISS. Hurtling around our planet some 250 miles up in the sky, travelling at about 17,500 miles per hour, or 5 miles a second, it's strange how many of us seem to take this 460-tonne football field-sized monster for granted. The ISS was first announced to the world at President Ronald Reagan's 1984 State of the Union Address. Reagan pitched the project, then codenamed Freedom, to the American people as the launch pad to a new era of prosperity, unshackled from the tiresome bonds of gravity. Just as the oceans opened up a new world for clipper ships and Yankee traders, said Reagan, space holds enormous potential for commerce today. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and do it within a decade. Alas, such high rhetoric failed to galvanize the nation, and nine years later, NASA's baby, by now some $10 billion in the hole, with little more than a stack of blueprints to show for itself, was almost ditched. Indeed, the whole enterprise was saved from the scrap heap of history by just a single vote cast during a tense debate in the US House of Representatives. Luckily for science, Russia was just emerging from its post-Cold War slump and offered to collaborate on the project. Finally, things started to really get off the ground, with the first components blasting off from terra firma just five years later in 1998. The station's design was like nothing ever attempted. Instead of launching the space station into orbit all in one piece, the decision was made to follow a modular layout. This meant components could be added or subtracted to the ISS according to need. As the number of international partners steadily rose to 16, friendly competition between nations led to a boom in creativity and investment in this brave new spacefaring dream. The station can simplistically be divided into the so-called Russian orbital segment and the United States orbital segment, though modules from other countries have been added over the years. Large-scale trusses provide the ISS with its backbone, on which nodes and modules are attached and fused together by clever so-called PMA connectors. Russian and US modules are recognizably different, appearing in disparate shapes and sizes, reflecting the payload capacity of the vessels that ferry them into orbit. Astronauts tend to agree, for what it's worth, that the Russian modules are more comfortable to live and work in. America's modules were delivered on the erstwhile Space Shuttle program, whereas Russian elements arrived into orbit on Soyuz rockets. Only certain sections of the ISS are inhabited. This pressurized network of modules and nodes has roughly the same combined internal volume as a Boeing 747. It contains six sleeping quarters, two bathrooms and a gym. The rest of the station is given over to laboratory, maintenance and experimental spaces. It's worth repeating that for 20 straight years now, the station has been continuously inhabited, and in that time has avoided any significant failure or loss of life. Not bad when you remember the ISS moves so fast it travels about as far as the Earth is from the Moon and back every single day. What's more astonishing is that practically none of the project's many thousands of designers and architects ever once went to space. So how is it powered? The ISS has a vast array of solar panels with a combined area of about one acre. These were installed during November of the year 2000 and were ingeniously folded into space shuttle payload bays like accordions, unfurling in orbit with painstaking slowness before being bolted to the trusses. Each segment of solar array is attached to the station by gimbals, which rotate the solar panels so they always face the sun, optimizing the power flow to the ISS grid. The four sets of arrays can generate anything between 84 and 120 kilowatts of energy, or roughly enough juice to power 40 homes. Power is distributed around the station through roughly 8 miles of cabling. In terms of software, the ISS is supported by some 3 million lines of computer code for its ground-based systems and another 1.5 million lines that run its flight control systems. Shockingly, the 52 onboard computers have, on more than one occasion, been infected by computer viruses. Most famously, a so-called worm virus known as W32.gamima.ag infected ISS systems back in 2007 as part of a nefarious campaign to, well, steal passwords for online video games. Apparently, the worm didn't present any significant threat to the mission and was dismissed by NASA technicians as a mere nuisance. One of the most attention-grabbing pieces of hardware on the ISS is its so-called Mobile Servicing System, or MSS, and in particular its catchily named appendage, the Canadarm2. 
Designed and built by a Canadian team, the arm, that's literally what it is, extends 58 feet from end to end with seven motorized joints and a flexible elbow in the middle. The arm's 4,000 pound titanium bulk and clever double-ended design enable it to move modules around the station, grab onto spacewalking astronauts and assist with docking spacecraft. The Canadarm 2 can be controlled from consoles in both the American Destiny module and from perhaps the most eye-catching module of all, the Cupola. Built by a team in Turin, the so-called Cupola, Italian for dome, is an attractive protruding module with seven windows, the largest central window extending an impressive 80 centimeters in diameter. Ideal for observing and controlling Canadarm 2, the Cupola is also a favorite spot for crew to gaze at the clouds and continents of Earth as they glide by miles below. More than one astronaut has joked that the Cupola bears an uncanny resemblance to the cockpit of Han Solo's Millennium Falcon in the Star Wars movies. Almost every single piece of kit on the ISS is bespoke and groundbreaking. For instance, its trusses and modules are bolted together with so-called zip nuts, a type of screw designed specially for the space program. Zip nuts are quick and effective to install, requiring precious little fiddly screwing, and as such, they've quickly become commonplace on even quite humdrum earthbound construction projects. But even among all that high-tech, good old-fashioned human bodging is often the order of the day. Like in 2005, when astronaut Stephen Robinson set out on a daring spacewalk to repair a dislodged component on the docking space shuttle. His tools? A set of forceps and his trusty hacksaw. During these past 20 years, technology on the ISS has advanced in leaps and bounds. One area that's shown particularly impressive improvement is water filtration. This is no small matter. Water is heavy and expensive to transport from Earth. The International Space Station's new Water Recovery System, or WRS, recycles the crew's washing water, shower runoff, condensation from the air, and yes, urine, human and animal. As such, the WRS reduces crew dependence on delivered water by some 65%. This provides ISS crew with not only clean drinking water, but an essential ingredient in the station's oxygen generation processes. This means the station can now regularly host six astronauts instead of just three, though notably Russian cosmonauts haven't yet taken up drinking each other's wee as enthusiastically as the Americans. Silly as all that may sound, the serious mission of the ISS is to learn as much as possible about how humans could potentially live and work in space for extended periods in the future. The station's microgravity environment is great fun if you're making a David Bowie video, as astronaut Chris Hadfield did back in 2013 but it can have deleterious effects on bone density and muscle mass. As such, astronauts need to work out for at least two hours a day. This presents its own unique engineering challenges. During the early days of the ISS, crew would run on a conventional treadmill, until it emerged that the constant thunder of pounding feet was disrupting the delicate scientific experiments that are the space station's bread and butter. Never deterred by an intractable problem, NASA engineers designed an ingenious low-impact treadmill, named the Combined Operational Load-Bearing External Resistance Treadmill, or Colbert. Entertainer Stephen Colbert had the new treadmill named after himself by cleverly hijacking an online NASA poll, encouraging his fans to vote for him en masse. Incidentally, Colbert also tried to get the urine processing system on the ISS rechristened Space Toilet Environmental Waste Accumulator Recycling Thingy, or Stewart, to needle longtime colleague and friendly broadcasting rival John Stewart. Jokes aside, the ISS is a place where serious science happens. Over 3,000 successful experiments have been carried out on board so far, leading to many hundreds of groundbreaking research papers. Right now, medical researchers on the ISS are working on new techniques to disrupt malignant blood flow in deadly pancreatic cancers, for instance. There's more. The Cold Atom Lab, a small fridge on board the ISS, is currently the coldest place in the known universe, hovering at temperatures just above absolute zero. The Cold Atom Lab is the only place humans have ever been able to harness the so-called fifth state of matter, or Bose-Einstein condensate. Cool, huh? One of the most enlightening studies saw astronaut and twin Scott Kelly spend a year aboard the ISS, helping prove the efficacy of vaccines in zero-gravity environments, and settling some unanswered questions about human cognition and the effects of radiation on our DNA, compared with his identical brother who stayed on Earth. The ISS's role as a unique crucible of psychology research cannot be overstated. Here, the sun rises and sets 16 times a day, creating a unique sleeping situation, necessitating complex systems of lighting and physical restraints to maintain healthy circadian rhythms. Radical temperature shifts cause the very metal fabric of the station to warp and pop almost hourly, meaning astronauts often sleep with earplugs so as not to dwell on every ominous creak and groan. 
real research happens here. From amazing discoveries about dark matter, courtesy of the station's one-of-a-kind alpha magnetic spectrometer, to unique data gathered from animal crewmates like butterflies and bobtail squids, what's being learned right now will echo down the annals of science for generations to come. And ISS spin-off technologies, from those construction fixings to robot surgeons inspired by the Canadarm2 to water recycling plants that could revolutionise drought-ridden communities, will benefit humanity in more ways than it's currently possible to calculate. But perhaps the most striking thing about the engineering of the ISS is that it even happened at all. Sixteen nations collaborating on a project requiring hitherto unprecedented precision and care. Think of it. During the early design phase, for instance, American engineers used imperial measurements while the Russians worked in metric. Yet somehow it works. And 20 years on, we should all salute this magnificent symbol of what the human race can accomplish if we work through our differences and set our aims sky high.